Welcome everyone to the fourth of the ACM Maritime Trade Routes webinar series. Our moderator tonight is ACM Senior Curator for Southeast Asia, Dr. Stephen Murphy. He curated a special exhibition, Angkor, exploring Cambodia's sacred city in 2018, as well as the Tang Shipwreck Gallery at the ACM. He specializes in maritime trade of the first millennium and the art and archeology span of Buddhism and Hinduism in Southeast Asia. Dr. Murphy, please. Uh, thank you, Denise. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. And what Denise said, this is the fourth, uh, the fourth of five lectures in this series, actually. So before I um, introduce tonight's talk, just to let you know that the final lecture in this series uh, will take place at this time next week. And um, we're very fortunate to have uh, John Guy of the Metropolitan Museum, the curator for Southeast Asia. Um, and he's going to talk about um, Indian trade textiles. The title of his talk is Cloth for Spice and Spice for Cloth. So look out for that one. That will be the last in, the, in this series. I hope you've all enjoyed it so far. Um, tonight, we're going to do, um, we're going to look at Asian export art. Um, I think if any of you have tuned in for the first um, uh, three of the, the lectures of this series, the first two, we looked more at the sort of geopolitics and cultural heritage uh, issues and so forth. Um, if you had caught Horst Liebner's talk a few weeks back, it was very much on the maritime archaeology of uh, the maritime trade routes and so forth. So we thought it would be nice for the last two lectures to really focus on art and the objects that have been traded um, on these trade routes. Um, so tonight we're looking at it in a more uh, uh, a bigger picture in, in terms of, of trying to get maybe to the heart of the matter of what is Asi Asian export art. And then, of course, next week, John Guy will, will focus on some very specific um, examples uh, with Indian trade cloth. Um, before I talk a little bit about the format tonight, let me introduce uh, our three speakers. We're very fortunate to have uh, three curators here from three very uh, esteemed and distinguished museums. Um, first of all, all we have um, Karina Corrigan. Um, she is from the Peabody Essex in Salem, Massachusetts. So thank you, Karina. It's a very early morning start for her. Uh, we appreciate it. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> She's got a coffee at the ready, so. I do, my calamity wear coffee. <laughs> perfect. I mean, that's probably that's probably perfect for tonight, I would imagine. <laughs> hopefully. Well, hopefully not. Um, yeah, and Karina's interests uh, center on the material culture of global connections. She is the associate director of collections at the at the Peabody Essex and the H. A. Crosby Forbes curator for Asian export art. Um, for 2022, she is co-curating with Stephanie Tung. Uh, the next upcoming exhibition, which is Early Photography of China, Imagining Hybrid Worlds. So uh, look out for that. And we also have with us tonight um, from the Netherlands, uh, Jan van Kampen from the uh, Rijksmuseum. Uh, he has worked uh, for the auction house, Bob Kuiper, for the Dutch National Museum of Ceramics at Prinsenhof at Leeuwarden, and is currently curator of Asian export art at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Uh, and his main interest is collection history of Asian art in the Netherlands from the 16th to 20th century. Uh, so welcome, uh, Jan, as well. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And then, of course, uh, last but definitely not least, is our very own uh, Clement Ong, who's a uh, senior curator here at the Asian Civilizations Museum. And uh, he also looks at Pranakan art uh, as well. His research interest lies in exchanges between Asia and Europe in the 16th to 18th century. Uh, his research focuses on trading networks and the spread of Christian faith in Asia, particularly in the Indian subcontinent, Japan, China, and the Philippines. So that's our team of, uh, of curators for tonight. Um, I wanted to um, change the format up tonight a little bit. And so we won't have a, they won't be giving formal or presentations. So instead, this is going to be very much a conversation between the four of us. Um, and they've each selected three objects that they think encapsulate or represent what Asian art is. So the idea really tonight is to have this conversation between the four of us um, quite organically. And hopefully as we go through the, this process, we'll, we'll sort of get to maybe an understanding.
Sorry, I was unmuted for a sec. Um, yeah, what Asian art is, uh, maybe what it isn't, what, what, why is it a problematic term? Is it a valid term? So lots of questions, uh, lots of really quite interesting art to look at as well. Um, and I, I wanted to say as well for the audience, um, instead of, again, of, of leaving your, uh, the Q&A to the end, uh, because this is more of a conversation style format, please enter your questions uh, as we go along and, and then I will actually um, ask them to, the, um, the, to the, the panelists as we go along so that again, you, you all can participate in this in sort of more uh, uh, real time as opposed to having it at the end. So, so do feel free to um, post your questions as we go along and I'll, I'll do my best to, uh, to incorporate as many of them as possible into the discussion. So with all that being said, I think we'll, uh, let's go to our first uh, item. All right. So we have these two, uh, these two blue and white um, vases in front of us, uh, one from the Peabody Essex. Sound, Stephen. Yeah, I don't know, for some reason I keep getting unmuted. Okay. Um, so yeah, Karina, maybe you could go first and you could uh, tell us uh, why you selected uh, this particular object and what about it makes it, or how would we consider it Asian export art? Well, thank you, Stephen. It's so wonderful um, to be here with you all. It was great to see um, all of these uh, many familiar names uh, filing in from the waiting room. So it's wonderful to be um, here in this remote space together tonight, this morning. Um, one of the three uh, pieces I selected was this large covered vase. Um, the Peabody Essex Museum opened a new building about a year ago, and the, the central floor of that space is uh, dedicated to Asian export art. And we really began our planning for the entire gallery with this one piece. Um, it was um, technologically, technically, uh, really a superlative, piece of porcelain when it was made in Jingdezhen in the early 18th century. But um, we were also particularly interested in its provenance. Um, this is one of the 18 Chinese export porcelain so-called soldier vases that Augustus the Strong, the elector of Saxony and the king in Poland, traded an entire regiment of mercenary soldiers uh, for. So we felt that that story um, could be potentially compelling for people who care far less about Chinese porcelain than all of us do. So it is one of the signature objects that, um, that greets you. I think in, it, in and of itself, it is not necessarily export art, but I think the fact that it was exported and has this uh, wonderful history with it certainly um, spoke to us. I think the piece um, that Jan wanted to talk about now uh, share some of those things, but also um, has has some different things to offer. Yes, certainly. <clears throat> I um, I wanted to introduce this face <clears throat> exactly because one of the issues Karini, Karina already raised that you can ask the question whether you should classify it as export art or as exported art, and I think. This is an example of a beautiful vase from the beginning of the 17th century that was traded to the Netherlands, but was also appreciated in China. So arguably you could say it was produced for the market and on the market there were um, Chinese clients and there were also foreign merchants who brought it to the Netherlands or to Europe. That's very interesting, I think. And for me, this is also a very, interesting museum piece because it is from a very specific period in the history of trade of the Netherlands. It is from the period 1635 to 1650 when the Dutch had a settlement in Formosa and were able to trade this high quality porcelains to Europe. And then at the same time you can say it is high quality porcelain. It is not very, very exceptional. It, it came in large numbers. So that is something that I think is very interesting about, about this kind of luxury objects that reached Europe at the time, that they were luxuries, but they were 
affordable lux luxuries. Mm -hmm. So they were pieces that were within reach of a larger part of society than before. And we can see in this time that there is a shift, a transformation from, from the very exclusive collectible to a commodity, a kind of right. a prop that is everywhere in, in everyone's household. So it's quite interesting because then uh, I guess Therese, or sorry, Karina's uh, example then is maybe more of the, that's, I, you know, exclusive, exclusivity if you had to trade a whole regiment of soldiers, that's, that's it seems quite something. Yeah. Um, well, it is, you, uh, maybe, it, sorry, too, Stephen, but it yeah. is, maybe it's important to say that they look similar in size, but Karina's face is, 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 is at least twice as tall as mine. That's, it's important. Yeah, and actually Richard says, thank you. There, there was a question of the, the, the dimensions of the Peabody uh, vase. So Richard, our editor, has kindly jumped in. Yeah, so it's 91 centimeters by 40. It's quite yeah, considerable. Yeah, three feet uh, high. Yeah, so it's, it's really massive. And we have a shot later that we'll show you of it in the gallery so people will get a, a sense of perspective then. Um, into, and, and Jan then, so what about the, the, the vase from the Rijksmuseum? It's, it's, so what is it, about 30 centimeters then? Or? Yeah, 40, I think, yeah. 40, yeah. yeah. So maybe you could talk, <laughs> talk a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. He's, uh, he's from Boston, so you know, that's, that's probably why this is happening. Uh, anyway, maybe we could talk a bit more about um, why it was, to try and get to, you know, the sort of, maybe some of the key questions about Asian art. Why was blue and white porcelain so popular in Europe or, or in, in the Americas uh, later on um, at, this, at this point in time. I don't know if Clem, you want to jump in here as well. I mean, what's kind of driving this, um, this, this demand? Um, well, I really think that um, at the point that it was, a, it was very, very beautiful. It was, it was technically something that um, was people in Europe were not able to produce for, for many years. The first porcelain was, as many people know, produced in Germany in 1712, I think. So this was something that was kind of a miracle. And then it came for, well, for not very high prices. So that has made it very attractive, I think. And it is blue and white because um, that it is a technical issue that you can have the blue color um, in the in the kiln at a very high temperature, so it is you, it has to go to the kiln only one time. It is mm. relatively easy to produce, so the colors came later. Mm. All right. Uh, One thing I'm just yeah. struck by, and of course this we you know we we very rarely uh, look at things like this together um, in this way, and look at the the wonderful um, the leaf motifs on on the, the very top neck and how similar those are, even a you know, hundred years later. And obviously the form is very different, but, um, but obviously that, that is, that is uh, a continuity um, yeah. from the 16th to the 17th century. I, yeah, I, you know, certainly this is, these are both luxuries, but as Jan said, this is also the easiest way to make Chinese porcelain because of the single firing that you don't have to do anything else. And obviously because it was impossible, certainly for Europeans. And I think it's, it's, it's important that um, the, the large, the, the large vase associated with Augustus the Strong, this is, this is, um, is being made, is coming into Europe at precisely the moment that Europeans are first figuring out how to, to, produce, to produce porcelain on a large scale. And Augustus the Strong was one of the key drivers of that uh, discovery. His obsession um, was unmatched. He, he assembled a collection of over 30,000 pieces of Chinese and Japanese porcelain, many of which still survive in Dresden, which is quite uh, right. remarkable. Yeah, and um, we have another, actually we have another question, uh, more of a technical one from Ulrika. So she asked, the shades of blue seem to be different. Is this true or an optical illusion? And if true, uh, why? I presume she means on, on both paths? Well, yeah, it's true. Porcelain from the transitional period, like the, the one from the Rijks Museum, they are more renowned for their beautiful nuances in the blue and you can see that here as well mm -hmm. and there is a theory that um, 
um, orders from the imperial kiln stopped. So very, um, very, 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 very good potters and painters started to produce for the commercial market. And that's why it is so beautiful. Mm. And I think, I think, personally, I think that my vase is better than Karina's in this respect. <laughs> wow, we're, we're already on the first slide and, and, and it's already getting competitive. Okay. All right. Mine is bigger, Jan. Yeah, Mine is bigger. size matters. <laughs> that's <It's> true. American, <laughs> so size matters. And you have a lid. I don't have a lid. <laughs> okay, I think very quickly there's a question about provenance. How did the, how did the, um, the Augustus the Strong vase, how did it get to the Peabody Essex? Is that something you can talk about? So um, there were, as I mentioned, this is, so this is, was a, once part of the nearly 30,000 pieces that um, were at Dresden. Mm -hmm. And we know that because there is a palace inventory mark on the underside of the lid. In the early 20th century, um, the German government acknowledged that perhaps this was more porcelain than was necessary. And there were a series of sales um, and this was part of one of those sales. And it was for many years in um, a Swedish family collection and, and uh, came to us, um, I'm thinking about 20 years ago. Mm, interesting. Um, yeah, that, the museum in Dresden, I haven't been, but I've seen, uh, I've, I've seen some talks actually by one of the curators and it is, I mean, it's quite incredible, right? The amount of porcelain that they, they still have, even after selling off. That's quite something. Okay, I'll take one last question on this and then we should probably move on. Um, is the Peabody Essex Vaz considered a Kangxi porcelain? So more of a technical question. Jan, do you wanna, do you wanna take that as our ceramics expert? Oh, well, yeah, I have no doubt about that. I would call it a Kangxi porcelain. Hmm. What about you? Sure, yes, but I yeah. think being the ceramics expert, Okay, how, thank you. How, thank you, how do you for get, giving me the floor. Yes. How, Jan, t tell us a little bit about why you, why you know for certain, um, what are like the characteristics you're looking at that tell you that? Oh, well, this, um, because of the, 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 the color of the blue and the, the very um, whiteness of the white. Mm -hmm. And um, it's also because we, we, we know of this, this is a famous set of vases that have been discussed and um, uh, a lot in literature, and they have always been published as Kangxi, as highlights of Kangxi um, porcelain. So I, I, I simply never started to doubt it. And then um, we know that um, Augustus was acquiring them, or that they, so they, they came from um, Berlin, I think, so that we know that they were already in Europe in the Kangxi period, so right. it's really so you have that solid no yeah, reason to doubt it. it in this case. Yeah. Yes, right, great. Okay, I think we'll move on to um, to our next one. So it's interesting because, like you both pointed out, this is a good place to start because you've called these these are more exported art as opposed to say maybe export art. But let's I guess we'll take it up a notch with these two. Um, so Clem, yeah, of course the one on the the one on the left is is maybe our unofficial mascot at ACM. And I, I guess it encapsulates in many ways what the stories we try and tell, particularly on the first floor, but you know, in terms of trade connections and cross-culturalism and hybridity in art and so forth. Um, so maybe, yeah, how about you start by um, telling us a bit about this piece? Sure, Stephen. Um, well, we, 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 as Stephen said, we sort of frame it and we call it as our unofficial mascot to the museum. Uh, well, what you see here, if you start to dissect the, the object of, you know, you have the Kangxi uh, period, a Qing dynasty uh, enamel biscuit by Horst, uh, porcelain. Uh, and then you see two sort of lacquered uh, cups uh, from, from Japan. And then of course, top, on, on top of it, it's mounted with a, a red uh, coral, uh, natural um, um, science specimen. Um, and, and along the whole sort of composition of the whole assembly, you see these gold uh, gilded bronzes um, uh, mounts that were put together uh, sometime in the uh, mid um, 18th century in, in France and Paris. 
um, also known as Omelu mouse. And what is really interesting is you have an object that comes from many different cultures, from China, from, from, from Japan, uh, that were collected, you know, some, some of these materials are what we compared the two uh, bases uh, um, uh, in the previous slide like as, as exported art or luxury arts, uh, objects that came from um, uh, Asia. Um, and, and somehow, you know, with, with, with the, the decorative uh, uh, art tradition in, in Europe, um, um, the mountains and craftsmen decide to land some of these objects and, and it gives, sort of give new meanings to it. And, and for, for ours, um, it, it, from, from purely uh, uh, precious objects, luxury objects, it transforms to something that is a little bit functional perhaps. Uh, as it, we, we know that it's a, it's a incense burner because if you open um, the, the lid um, of the, the lacquer cups, the, the bottom cup actually has a metallic tray on it. Uh, um, so, so that's one of the reason why we uh, call it as an incense burner. But I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to, to Karina to talk about hers as well, which is wonderful. Yeah, it's 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 really interesting that these are you know this is the both museums have a similar uh, type of wear. So yeah, it's Karina, tell us a bit about about your one. Well, I'm delighted to hear that um, your example is one of the signature pieces. This. Um, this, for the Peabody Essex Museum, I have to say that this has been on display almost continuously since it, it was acquired. And there have been several instances just for practical reasons that we had to take it off display. And I have to say that this is the object that the Peabody Essex Museum guides get most angry at me when it comes off display because they love this piece so much and um, love talking about it. I will say I sometimes have said this is a piece that only Liberace could love. <laughs> um, it is really over the top. Um, this is not a subtle piece at all. And like the example at ACM, this is a um, sort of a, a conglomeration of, of works from many different cultures. And we have this um, at another one of the entrances to the Asian Export Art Gallery. And um, at each, each entrance, we pose a question to our visitors. And for this um, object, we've posed the question, made in where? Certainly the, the phrase made in China means very different, may, means something very different in the 21st century than it did in the 18th century. And we certainly wanted to underscore that. But here, this is certainly one of the most um, complicated objects in the gallery. Um, the potpourri holder or potentially incense um, burner is uh, fabricated from a 17th century Japanese porcelain teapot that had its handle and spout cut off. And then the wonderful um, Chinese porcelain stag that dates um, 10 to 15 years later. So these objects that were both quite old when they were in Paris in the mid 18th century and a Marshal Mercier uh, assembled them with similarly with these gilded bronze mounts and the soft paste uh, porcelain flowers. And I love also thinking about the, the actual natural world um, in the ACM example with the coral and the fabricated natural world with these very delicately made um, French porcelain flowers. So so certainly made in Paris, but made in lots of other places as well along the way. Yeah, I mean, this is what's fascinating about it. Like, how do you, where do you pin it down? Jan, I think you said that um, the Rijksmuseum had something similar, or if it did, you would classify this as European no. art? And that? No, not, not, not really. We have very few pieces. Um, we have very few pieces um, that are really in good mounts, really mm. nice mounted pieces. And then they are definitely not in my department, if you can call it that way, but are in the department of the applied arts because they are mm -hmm. collected because of the mounts. And of oh. course I can look at it and I can, can incorporate it in my work, but it is, there is a distinction. This, so it is really seen as a, a French object in, in the Rijks Museum. Yeah, I mean, I guess when you look at in terms of taste, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely not, 
definitely not maybe Chinese taste of the period or, or Japanese taste for sure. And it's probably not Dutch taste either, is it? I mean, is that one reason why there's not many in the Rijksmuseum? Is this... That's absolutely true. So um, we have a few um, pieces in Dutch museum collections, not even not in the Rijksmuseum, with earlier pieces with silver mounts. Hmm. Uh, blue and white with silver mounts. And then, of course, we have a lot of later pieces from the 19th century with not very interesting or important uh, mounts. But we, we hardly have anything. We certainly haven't anything similar to this, and we mm. hardly have any French mounted uh, pieces. No, it's just not Dutch taste. No. We have sometimes said that objects like these are sort of the physical manifestation of the origins of the French Revolution. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's yeah exactly. That's a uh, that's a good way of looking at it. And we have a good, we have a, a good question from Michelle here. Um, so for both Clem and and, and Karina, um, could you summarize the motivation for assembling these objects? Um, what would you suggest to perhaps inspire curiosity? Um, Clem, you want to take that one first? Uh, sure. I think you know. First and foremost, uh, many of these Asian objects are collected as, as luxuries, sort of luxury item. Um, they might be more affordable for, for sort of a different, uh, uh, perhaps for the court or, or more for the sort of aristocrats or merchants levels. But, but there are also some other types of materials that are, are very much um, uh, accessible to, to the, the other sort of groups of people. Um, and, and one of the ways of sort of looking at Asian uh, objects um, at, a, at a point in time in Europe, perhaps there's also, you know, a kind of a fantasy in terms of design uh, wise to, to blend objects of uh, different cultures and, and mixing it with, you know, like, like in our examples, natural uh, history specimens with man-made object, you know, that, that whole idea of what is um, uh, um, natural and, and what is sort of, you know, man-made aesthetics, uh, which is very much a, a kind of a movement of aesthetics, particularly in the 17th and 18th century in, in Europe, also known as the Baroque uh, and Rococo, in, in terms of, you know, living with, with nature and, and, and what is artificial and, and what is natural. Yeah, you can definitely see that influence coming through in it quite strongly, right? Um, uh, conversation piece, Arika suggests. It definitely is. Uh, yeah. I guess that's why we all like it and the, the docents like it in the gallery as well. It, it's a fun piece. Karina, would you like to add on anything more? Well, I just think maybe certainly many of these assemblages incorporate um, Asian ceramics, but there are assemblages that incorporate things in, that are entirely European. So, so this isn't uniquely about um, incorporating Asian export art for these luxury retailers in, in Paris in the mid 18th century. Right. So it's actually more of a, a European phenomenon. And then these are just sort of specific examples where they've, they've used objects from Asia, maybe as it's a bit uh, sort of exoticism, right? Or, or maybe it makes it a bit more, yeah, again, more of a curiosity. Can I ask a question of sure. Clem? I'm, I'm curious about the, the dating of your piece. I mean, we, we tend to be very conservative. Um, we tend to, to, to do very broad dating. I think uh, in, in the gallery, it's a little bit more specific. I think we date the, um, the porcelain uh, horse uh, uh, as China, Jin Dezhen, around perhaps the uh, 1700s. Um, and then the, 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 the Japanese black and gold, maybe around the 18th century. Uh, we don't have a proper sort of, you know, a fixed period for it. And then uh, the, 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 the French mounts, uh, mid 18th century. Uh, that's, I think that's how we sort of break them down by material types. Because Karina, you have a very specific date on yours. Is, uh, um, so could you maybe yeah, let us tell us a bit about how you're maybe so definite about it? Well, I think, and of course, there is the very important word about there. <laughs> um, and I have to say, this is, this is entirely, um, uh, all of the dating of this is um, 
from my wonderful um, former and always colleague, um, Bill Sargent, whose catalog on our Chinese export porcelain is, is our Bible always. And, um, but my, my understanding is that really that, that this date is based entirely on the dating of the French mounts mm -hmm. and the soft paste uh, French porcelain flowers. Karina, if you look at the, the, the base, you know, of both of our objects and, and, and the support, you know, the new divine support uh, underneath the, the Japanese porcelain cover and, and the way that it sort of goes around on ours as well. I mean, there are lots of similarities as well uh, in terms of that style, that movement um, of, of the vegetation. And, and I mean, that's also, I guess, one of the reasons. Uh, comparing with other examples in, in European and French collections, uh, I think we followed that tradition to put it around mid 1800s or 1750s. Hmm. Okay, um, I think there's three questions. Uh, let's just, but the question for Karina, maybe you could deal with that later because I don't want to go back to the blue and white, but it's a, a question about the the Peabody Essex Lodge Bays and whether it's connected. The answer is yes, they are okay. related. They're related. Okay, great. Um, and then Another question about, um, are these mixed, these mixtures of Asian and European pieces, uh, are they, are they, can they be considered part of this China mania um, that was in France at the time? And were Europeans back then able to differentiate between Japanese and Chinese ceramic? Um, Clem, you wanna, we did a show, you did a show on China mania, we were. Were you involved in that? Maybe. Yes, um, well, most of the curators uh, at the museum were involved in that show. Um, you know, but, but I think um, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. Uh, yes, a bit of a yes and no, but as, we, as, as I think just early on, we mentioned that, you know, a lot of these uh, works of art um, would be seen more as um, French, uh, French art per se, it is just combining what is presently sort of in demand or what is popular uh, back then for people who have access to such luxury items and, and then how they sort of assembled uh, it, it as a new form of art, you know, with a bit of the, the, that European touch to it, I think. And, 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 and sort of the second part of the question is were Europeans back then able to differentiate Japanese and Chinese ceramics? I think it's also a yes and no question um, uh, in, in when, if the, the sort of the merchant's records or the dagger registers are, are very clearly classified as what is from China and what is from Japan, I think you have that clear documentation. But we also have seen in some uh, European collections of the uh, princely collection, um, uh, a lot of the perhaps Japanese porcelain has also sort of misattributed as Chinese porcelain sometimes as well. Not always, but sometimes I think I don't know. Maybe maybe Jan uh, would like to say something about the that. Yeah, well, I'm thinking about it, and I'm um, remembering to have seen um, very serious um, auction catalogues of, of very good collections, and then it is it, it looks it seems to be classified very um, very well. That is, if you group of Japanese portions, and if you read through the descriptions, you can really understand that these were Chi Japanese porcelains, and then you have the group of Chinese porcelains. And then at the same time, you have many um, inventories where any, everything is mixed up and where they didn't care at all whether to call it Indian porcelain or Japanese porcelain or Chinese porcelain. And then often the, Chi the Japanese porcelain, they meant colored wares and Chinese blue and white, so they felt is a certain freedom to use all those terms. So it is what, as Clem said, it is a yes and no answer to this question. And then this also applies to furniture and, and many other sort of, you know, material types, I think, in, 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 in a lot of these uh, inventory. Mm. Okay, let's move on to the, the third, talking about furniture. Clem, this is one of, one of your pieces. So we're, we're moving to a different medium now. We've looked at, at porcelain and, and, and so forth, I guess, which is probably maybe one of the more well-known types of export art that maybe would come to mind when we use the, the phrase. But, but how, this one is interesting because we have uh, you know, a different medium in terms of lacquer and then, of course, uh, a Christian scene. So can you tell us a, a little bit about this and how, how does this fit into uh, you know, this whole question of export art as well. 
Well, we, I mean, you mentioned about the different material types that we're engaging. So first we look at porcelain and, um, and, and the, another sort of very popular luxurious uh, object that is exported out of Asia is uh, lacquerware. Uh, and, and Japanese export lacquer uh, is one of the very prized uh, high in demand, particularly in the 16 or actually all the way to the 18, uh, 19th century even. Uh, but, but it first started with the, the very much with the Portuguese, Spanish, who were, who were based in Japan. And, and, and this is, we know all this through uh, archival letters from, from the missionaries. And one thing to note, I mean, what we, I inserted this here as um, a piece that I would like to talk about regarding Asian export art is that particularly in the 16th and 17th century, uh, trade and the, the sort of transmissions of the Christian faith, you know, both elements share a very strong symbiotic relationship that, that uh, we should not forget. And, and many of these um, uh, uh, export lacquers that were made for missionary orders or for churches uh, were actually commissioned by, by, by the missionaries um, themselves. And they had very detailed notes about how uh, you know, how they love the, the black and the gold with the, the mother of pearl inlays, as you can see from, from this uh, particular uh, a portable shrine. And a portable furniture is something that, again, is, is very in and, 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 and easy to manage because uh, many of these merchants and missionaries, they travel by large ships. Uh, and, and, and so you, you see a lot of boxes, chairs, furniture that were made to be handled uh, easily. Uh, portability is one of the very key uh, uh, aspects of it. And, and likewise, you know, this, this is something that is so easy for missionaries to carry, you know, when they are, when they are uh, um, uh, uh, preaching or, or sort of teaching the Christian faith to mm -hmm. the local people. Yeah, that, so the thing that's interesting here is, is in the last example, we, we looked, you know, it's, it's French, um, French making export out of, out, of, out of Asian products. But, but this piece is sort of the opposite. It, it's, um, this is, can you tell us more about who made this? Because this obviously is a commission or it's made for, like you say, for um, Christian missionaries. But it, you know, for example, the painting, who was the painting executed by mm -hmm. Western artist or is it uh, an Asian hand? Uh, do, we, do we have that information? Well, the, the, this type of um, oratory or, or a lot of these lacquer uh, works were made uh, in, usually in Japan and, and usually in Kyoto. Um, you know, there are lacquer, Japanese lacquer craftsmen who, who produces a lot of these uh, works. Uh, in regards to whether the, the painting of our particular uh, shrine, whether is it made in Japan or not, is actually an oil and copper painting. Um, I don't know. I guess this is one of the, the fun things in our job is, is that, you know, we, we, we um, sometimes we just don't know. And then I think this is one of the interesting cases that I've been asked, uh, asking a lot of uh, fellow colleagues, curators and, and scholars, you know, some would say that, you know, it, it has this strong Flemish school of, of painting, you know, probably Spanish or, or, or there is even one uh, particular uh, uh, suggestion that maybe even uh, 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 South America, Latin America, uh, uh, as, as another suggestion. Um, but, but I mean, for those who know of this type of imagery, uh, there is three, I mean, including ours, the, there are three Namban uh, oratory like this, um, and that has the best of same painting, but they're all different in sizes. So, so again, the question is, whether are these paintings commissioned uh, before or, or the, the shrine is being built first and then the painting is then uh, made later and then to be inserted to, to the, the work itself. Mm. Um, but we, for, we know of the, the prints that they were based on, right? Or, or it, yes. Yeah, so uh, I think we can trace it to, again, many of these works in the 16th, 17th century, uh, well, Japanese uh, Christian works or or Christian works that were made in Japan uh, that were very heavily influenced by uh, European works and European prints as well. And I think this is uh, one of the, by the Warwick's brothers. Uh, but, but there are some modifications. They did not follow it uh, uh, very faithfully. 
uh, the text is a little bit different from most of the prints. So they must have access to many different uh, prints, uh, European prints, but there is a bit of a mix and match uh, that is happening uh, with, with, with some of these composition at times. Hmm. All right, um, let's move on because Karina has, there's two questions, but I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna let Karina go first with her example. And then I, because I think uh, the questions actually address both. So Karina, you have a, a, a similar um, item in the Peabody Essex. You wanna tell us a bit about this? And actually you have you have some maybe a bit more clarity in terms of the painting as well, maybe. Um, yes, well, when we were sort of thinking about how we were gonna structure this, I thought it might, it might be fun to include this example, which is in the Peabody Essex uh, Museum's collections. And we acquired this about um, 20 years earlier than the ACM acquired theirs. And um, certainly the scholarship on these kinds of objects has expanded quite a lot since um, uh, we acquired it. But what I thought was interesting to think about is when we purchased this for PEM, the assumption was we were buying a spectacular non-bun lacquer um, uh, case, the portable shrine, but that within that case was a painting done in Europe, that this had been added in Europe. But in fact, when we actually um, did further study, the, the, the painting, while it indeed, like, like the example at ACM, is clearly very much based on European print sources. And this is, this is a Netherlandish print source from about 100 years prior to this uh, work being made. So a very old source being repurposed. But it's entirely, um, the, the painting is done on an Asian hardwood panel which of course is, is not a medium, a substrate that would ever have been used by a European painter. And um, there's been quite a lot of work done on the school of Giovanni Nicolo, who was one of these Jesuit missionaries in Japan, who was teaching, and there were certainly European artists working there, but also um, one of the principal purposes was to teach Japanese artists how to create this, uh, these works for religious devotion um, to foster the spread of Christianity within Japan. And so indeed here, again, we have, is it, is it for export? Is it for consumption uh, within Japan? And maybe, Stephen, do you mind if I then, if I go on the tangent of Asian export art or do you, do you want go to for it, that go for it. Here? Yeah. No, certainly we, you know, we three, Jan and Clem and I are the only curators in the world who have the words Asian export art in our job title. Um, certainly this is material that is in many museums and many curators are dealing with this. And it's a, it's a, it's a specific um, term that I, I think, it, I think the, the founder of our department, Crosby Forbes, may even be credited with, with coining it's problematic because, of course, this is clearly an object that isn't necessarily um, made for export. And I think when I'm thinking about what we work on, these are um, objects of cross-cultural exchange with a lens toward Asia. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, um, that would be a more accurate definition of the kinds of material that we three are working on. That's very long for a, for a business card. So as much as it is a problematic term, I think until we, until we can come up with something that's a little bit more concise, I think at least we're planning to stick with it, albeit acknowledging that it is not actually uh, fully uh, encapsulating the concepts that we're, we're talking right. about. It's, it's a hard, I guess even from the examples we've looked at so far, it, it's, it, yeah, it is a hard thing to, to pin down and, and pin down. And maybe we shouldn't worry too much um, about that. I mean, I guess as, as academics and curators, we like to try and be able to classify everything, but, but maybe, yeah, part of the joy of it is the, like the, like, you know, the, the surprise that of this, this piece in particular that, you know, you thought, you know, there's that quite Eurocentric assumption as well when, when it was acquired that, that the painting was done by, you know, a European hand. And then it, it turns out that it's actually, uh, done in Asia. Again, so it, there's, there's lots of, sort of interesting um, paths we, you can go down with this with this type of art. But yeah, maybe that's a discussion, a larger discussion for, <laughs> for another day. To that, you know, this, this type of materials, I mean, firstly, they could also be uh, made 
in, in Japan, but were better presented to gifts to some mm. of the, the sort of regional lords there. So it can also be sort of an emissary kind of a gift of uh, goodwill and gesture uh, with the intention, of course, to, to convert uh, 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 the local Japanese there. But, but, but many of the time, I mean, most of the surviving uh, examples of such uh, lack of works were also very well kept in, in monastery and churches and in European collection as well. So, so there is also that, that export uh, uh, sense, you know, for the, the missionaries to prove to their superiors that they're doing great job in, in Asia uh, and, and they're in need of, you know, that, that the Asian artists are able to produce uh, works like this. Okay, I'm going to take one of the questions and then we, we better move on to Jan's example, but um, for, it's, it's addressed to Clem from Mati Lopez, but I think it, it's probably relevant for Karina's example as well. Um, how can these artworks, uh, how can they be distinguished with typical religious art from the Philippines or India? Recently, the Ayala Museum had to reclassify a whole album by Damien Domenico to that of a Chinese export artist known as known as noted by Dr. Nina Baker. And then, you know, a follow-up question, what about the Jesuit, Jesuit seminary of painters? Could, you know, for particularly for um, Karina's example, could they have painted it, you know, but maybe again, it's, it's unusual to do it on that type of hardwood. Um, the Jesuit seminary of painters where? Yeah, yeah. I, they there don't are say, lots of Jesuit yeah. seminaries of painters all mm. over the place. But I mean, we believe this was painted in Japan. Right. But, but I think that's also what is tremendously exciting about this whole field is, I have often said I'm a dilettante and I know a little bit about a lot of things. And part of our role is to bring in people who are, who are digging in much greater depth in specific areas. Um, but there is lots of reclassification coming. I think later in, in, the, the talk, we'll see a, um, a cabinet that, um, well, I won't, I won't say anything about it, but, right. but certainly um, uh, I think as with everything with art history, there are art historical um, avenues to pursue. There are analytical avenues to pursue. One of, one of the things that is sort of on my long-term to-do list, the painting in this um, portable uh, shrine is um, could use a little cleaning. And I think in anticipation of the opening of the wing, we very well might have cleaned it. But what I was, was concerned about is a number of Japanese scholars have talked about the fact that um, the varnish on here may be done with a fish glue that is distinct to a Japanese um, Japanese production, and I didn't want to clean it and lose mm, the evidence of that. And you know, if we had had more time, I would have sent this off to the, you know, to to, to do all kinds of spectacular analytical testing, which um, hopefully mm -hmm. at some point we will be able Sometime to do. Will. Find the time and the money to do that. Oh. Uh, but but there are lots of lots of ways, and and mm. uh, we are continually learning. I think. Great. All right, let's move on to Jan's example, because this is another uh, interesting case, because, you know, on the surface, it looks very European. But Jan, tell us, tell us why that you've selected this one. Yes, I selected one of the reasons that I selected it is that we know exactly by whom and when it had been commissioned. So this is commissioned by Mr. Andreas Everardus van Bram Hoekgeest, who was a Dutch merchant in Canton, and he was there in 1790. And the um, crucial thing about this object is that it is a mirror. The, the dull gray upper part of the background once was a shiny mirror. So it is very important to realize that when you look at it, you, so, you see your own reflection, you saw your own reflection. And this, um, this will have worked best for Mr. Van Bram himself, when he was looking at it. So he was looking at it, seeing his own reflection, and at the same time, he was seeing his wife, who was there in the medallion in the center of it, in the painted part of the mirror. And the wife is looking up at him while she's reading probably his letter that she received. So I think this is a wonderful example of a work produced in Canton and which 
is the result of a fine cooperation between a Chinese paintings studio and the, the, the patron, uh, Mr. Van Braam. And what is very special, I think, about it is that it is, you can see that there's a, quite a program in, in, in the painting and that they combined a lot of different, um, different models to, to produce this, this, this program in the painting. So, for example, you can see, of course, the, the portrait of Madame van Braam in the, in the middle. And then we know that it is really only the hat that was provided by van Braam. He probably had a kind of a medallion with him uh, on his journey and he could show that to the painter. But we know that the rest of her body and with the letter in her hand is, is a template that was in the painting studio. We see that in various other examples, exactly this reading lady at her table. So there is a nice combination. And then we also have um, the, um, the example, the, the model of the allegorical lady who is holding the medallion. We know that this is from a print by um, Mr. Haubraken. And we also know that this print was around in Canton because we have a tea set from 20 years earlier where exactly the same print has been used. And what is amazing, I think, is that they, they, they agreed in changing it a little bit to change the message. Because in the print, the allegorical lady is vigilant with her um, attributes. And here they change it because you can see the anchor and the palm leaves. Um, and the anchor is for hope, of course, and the palm leaves are for victory or for Asia. So the message is that we have the hope that... Um, that my voyage to Asia will bring victory, will, will help us out because they were at the moment they were in problem, they were a financial problem, and then this will will will, will help us solve all these those problems. Great. Uh Clem or Karina, have you any other comments on this or, or should we move on? We're getting we've got about 15, 20 minutes left. So we have a, two more examples to go after this. It is another interesting, I guess, it, again, it's a good example because, it, you know, we, we were talking before about uh, Japanese painters or whether artworks were painted in Japan. And then here you have, a, I guess, again, a similar thing with Chinese painters. All right, let's, let's move on to, um, on to the next example. Uh, so Clem and, um, and Karina are going to talk to us a bit about about textile, because this is another very important uh, medium. Um, so, Clem, do you want to go first? Or Karina, you had your hand up. Um, no, I was just going to say that um, that uh, for me, this is a particularly poignant work for a variety of reasons, not least of which Jan and I were at a most fascinating conference on Chinese export reverse paintings on glass in February, and it was sort of the last, the last big sort of um, global gathering before our, our complete lockdown. It was a spectacular conference and um, there will be papers, uh, uh, a, a volume of the papers produced right. from that, that I think is gonna be a wonderful contribution mm -hmm. to the scholarship on this material. But, but I think we definitely also wanna be sure that people are, are looking closely at the wonderful textile yeah, in, right. this, Let me zoom in this, on this. Which is a nice meeting. prelude to the, to the next, uh, as well. Yes. Yeah, the text, I, I looked at the textile and um, we can't be for a hundred percent sure, but it is probably is a Persian carpet. And um, we know that in exactly in this time, um, VOC and VOC merchants were trading Persian carpets from their settlement in India. And we also know that they were around in, in China at the time because there was a connection, trade connection between India and China. Interesting topic that needs more attention. And we know that there were um, doing preparations for an, um, a special embassy to the Chinese court and in the lists of presents that they brought to the Chinese emperor are large floor carpets and must be um, Persian floor carpets. There's, they just ha didn't have the time at the moment because they were at a rush. They didn't have the time to 
to bring European carpets to Asia. So they looked around in Asia and the Persian carpets were by far the most prestigious. So it's interesting to have this included in this Chinese painting. Mm, yeah, fascinating. Yeah. All right, on that note, yeah. Seb, you want to start with the... Yeah, uh, I think it's also when, when I look at Yan's selection with the, um, you know, the one of my favorite reverse glass painting uh, in his collection, um, that, that, that possibility of, of having that Persian or Middle Eastern carpet uh, being, being, being sort of depicted in, in the painting itself, which, which really reminds me, well, not connected, but in some ways, you know, one of the pieces in the, uh, in the Indian trade cloth collection uh, at the, the ACMs. Uh, and, and I particularly picked this one because, you know, we, we keep referring to um, Indian cottons that were being um, uh, exported to Europe, uh, uh, mainly via the VOC uh, uh, trade. Um, and, and some of these were also sort of made specifically for the Southeast Asian market. But, but here you have an example that, 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 that resonates or have its influence um, uh, very similar to, to some of the Islamic models and, and very close to a carpet design per se, you know, uh, something that you will see um, perhaps also uh, in Iranian carpets as well. So I thought that this is quite a fascinating example. And of course, Karina already picked a very classic uh, tree of life uh, 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 plum pool hanging. So, 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 so I thought that, you know, uh, at least uh, I should show something that is um, a little bit different. But I'll leave the, uh, the print talk part to Karina to talk more. Well, I mean, I think this, this is a wonderful um, comparison and it certainly is true for many of the other media that we're talking about, these, these incredibly talented artists who are producing um, works of great luxury simultaneously for profoundly different markets. So, so these kinds of things are coming out of this, uh, the same studios. Um, and I think particularly for me, and of course you're gonna hear lots more about this next week from John Guy, who is much better uh, equipped to talk about these things than either Clem or I. But I think just in general, you know, lacquer still has, um, even in the 21st century, a, a sense of luxury, but cotton really doesn't. Cotton in the United States, we, there was an ad campaign, the fabric of our lives. This is, this is something that is mass produced, you know, since the industrial revolution, we really think about this as, um, an inexpensive, easily accessible material. But at the time that these things were being made, these were as luxurious as any of the, the lacquers or the porcelains that are being um, transported globally. And if that's, that's of course, because the Indians were the master dyers to the world. They, they knew how to create these incredibly vibrantly colored textiles, not only create the designs, but secure secure those colors so that they could be repeatedly washed and still retain um, retain these colors. The example in the Peabody Essex Museum's collection is from a large collection of about 180 pieces um, that um, are 18th century textiles um, to a greater great extent, but were assembled in the early 20th century in the Netherlands at a time when very few people were um, looking at this material, interested in this material. So we were very um, delighted to be able to acquire the whole collection. And there's a selection of these uh, works from the Veldman Asen collection in the Asian Export Art Gallery um, on rotation, because obviously textiles do need to be uh, rotated more than porcelain does. Mm. Yes, they're beautiful objects, but I guess for any, any museum curator that has to deal with textiles, it's always, it's always a bit of a challenge. Um, and okay. those conservators as well. Exactly. Um, okay, I think, uh, as you say, uh, John Guy is going to really look at this in depth ne next week, but I think it's a nice preview to have it. And, and of course, they are such an important aspect of, um, of export art, um, and particularly within, you know, the Southeast Asian connection as well. But in the interest of time, I think I'll we'll go on to the, the last example. Um, oops, right there. There we go. All right, Jan, how, how about you start us off with the, um, with the chest? So we've, we've moved to... Accelerates, yes. This is an object that um, I liked to introduce because um, the previous 
One is, is, is clearly um, commissioned by a private uh, merchant, it's a private enterprise, but this is um, commissioned by the VOC itself. So this is a, a box with nine bottles in it, and the bottles contained um, oil extracted from spices. And that was very expensive because you need quite a lot of spices to make a small bottle of oil. And they were used as a diplomatic gift. And we know from the VOC archives that the VOC commissioned in 1686, six cases, sandalwood cases in Japan with, um, with blue and white bottles to be used as, uh, to be filled with the oil and used as a diplomatic gift. And we also know that they arrived in Batavia in 1687, together with a batch of 100 extra bottles. And this is not a sandalwood box, so this is probably something made in Batavia for um, the, the remaining 100 bottles and then used as a, as a gift. And I think this is, is a wonderful um, work of art or a wonderful object um, from the global connection because you have the, the spices from the Moluccas and from, from Ceylon and then you have Japanese, um, a Japanese uh, bottle, Japanese porcelain and you have um, woodworkers work and silver smith work from Batavia and, is, and it is commissioned by, by, by a Dutch institution so everything comes together in this in this object. Yeah, it's a nice one to uh, to sort of round off the discussion in one way, because as you say, it, and it's also, it, it really encapsulates, I guess, a lot of the currents that, that go into producing this art form. Um, Clem, how about the, the object that you've, you've chosen? Uh, Matthew Lopez will be happy now. So, yeah. Again, again to, to tie with uh, Jan's uh, selections, you know, with the connections of Octavia, I thought, you know, Let's, let's move to another part of Southeast Asia and let's talk about the Philippines. Because uh, the Philippines itself, uh, again, is a very interesting case study if you look at it as a, as a port city. Um, and it's, you know, if you, if you, if you like, it's, it's really one of the um, Axis Mundi at that point in time. Uh, one of the sort of, you know, nexus that connects by the Pacific Ocean all the way to Acapulco, Mexico City, Veracruz, and then it enter uh, uh, Europe from, from that. Uh, part of the world. So, so this, this object, I mean, you know, we have seen similar, I mean, it, it is, a, let's start by talking about the object. It is a, a cabinet uh, with a forefront uh, a cover. Um, sometimes they often refer these as a portable writing desk because uh, you can let the forefront come down and then, you know, you can do your documents uh, using it as sort of like a, a little desk panel. Um, and uh, basically, uh, it's, it's, it's a type of, of furniture that, again, you see very commonly in, in those um, uh, Portuguese or Spanish influenced uh, uh, port cities. Um, uh, what is really interesting about this is that we have seen similar examples in, uh, in the Ayala collection. In fact, you know, uh, since we, we mentioned about the Ayala Museum uh, earlier on, uh, and then in, in other sort of uh, Philippines collection as well, we have seen similar types of chests with the same type of a bone inlay uh, decoration along the sort of borders uh, uh, of the, um, the cabinet. Um, what is also interesting is you notice the feet, I mean, based on this picture, it might be a bit difficult. You see sort of lion heads with, with, with uh, poor feet coming up uh, at the bottom. And even if you, if you look at the, um, the, the, the drawer knobs, again, you see, you know, very, uh, Chinese, perhaps, looking uh, lion heads uh, on it as well. So, so we know that, you know, there are lots of uh, Fujian, Southern Chinese uh, um, uh, craftsmen, furniture or ivory craftsmen as well, working in Manila at a point of time. Would this be something that was inspired or out of the hand of these Chinese craftsmen? Or, or is this something that inspired some of the Filipino uh, furniture maker and drawing inspiration? from, from um, um, uh, Chinese work. Uh, what is really interesting about this is it is quite a special commission piece because on the interior of the forefront, uh, you see there is a diagram which uh, we can identify it as the founding myth of a uh, Tetan Chitman. Uh, and today, very commonly, you know, you, you see it a lot 
uh, as the coat of arms of uh, Mexico, uh, um, um, Mexico, uh, the country itself, you know, with the eagle uh, uh, surmounted on top of this cactus and then on its beak, it, it captures a, a, a snake. And then a lot of all this work, I mean, you know, I noticed that uh, Hugo Miguel Greshko is, uh, is part of our uh, um, uh, participants here. So a lot of the work, you know, it's uh, credited to him to, to identify uh, and pick the print uh, of, of this. So thank you, Hugo. <laughs> nice. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I think the, the other great thing about this is, is that we talked about it. It brings in the, um, the Americas as well. You know, maybe the discussion so far focus more on sort of Asia, Europe, uh, Southeast Asia. But but of course, the other the other uh, aspect of this is the Americas. And Karina, just sort of as we finish up, do you want to talk a little bit more about the Amer Seeing as you're a, you're a museum. I think when we said at the start, it was, it, this is interesting because we have, you know, Karina who's based in the United States and, and Jan in Europe and then Clem and myself right here in, in, in Asia. So we're all geographically in, in, in these different areas as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about the American connection, either North America uh, or um, even, even the, uh, Central and Southern, South America as well in terms of the Asian art, phenomenon of Asian art? Sure. Well, maybe I will just say that, of course, the origins of the Asian export art collection at the Peabody Essex are rooted very specifically in um, Salem's global trade in the, the late 18th and early 19th century. But in part because of Crosby Forbes, we, we began to expand the circle of what we were interested in and certainly focusing more on European market and Southeast Asian market materials. Um, I have to say that I went to a conference at the Denver Art Museum almost 20 years ago, I think, and that was really focused on the Spanish colonial market. And I thought, why have we been all so excited about all these Chinese export porcelains for Boston and Salem and Philadelphia, which are very um, pedestrian compared to the luxuries that were coming via Manila um, um, to the vice royalties of, of New Spain and, and Peru. And I think that certainly there has been much more work done on that um, of late and certainly um, much more so. I think Clem and I are both very interested in Manila as this, um, the entrepot that is, that is at, the, at the center of all of this, um, this South, you know, this engagement with um, both the Americas and and Asia. So I think it's a wonderful this this cabinet is a wonderful work to end our conversations with today. Great. Okay. I think yeah, I'm cognizant of time. We're sort of nearly up. So what we we have each of you have provided us with uh, or provided me with one or two gallery shots because um, we thought I think we all thought it would be interesting as we have three curators here to see how, you know, cause I said, you know, I think what's become clear through this discussion is, is there's so many different ways of approaching and discussing these stories and even trying to define this, this work of art. So, so how would you curate it? You know, I'm thinking of what Jan was saying near the start that some of the objects would be in the European section in, in, in the Rijksmuseum and so forth. So maybe just very briefly, uh, Karina, you're up first with this really amazing shot. Um, well, I think this is great in terms of, as Jan pointed out, that the scale of our two pieces that we began with is very different, and you get a sense of the, the scale of this um, this vase that was um, in Augustus the Strong's collection. And what you're seeing in the background is um, the what the porcelain wall, and we wanted really to evoke these um, early 18th century European tradition of putting porcelain all on the wall. And then on a very practical level, of course, I wanted to get an entire gallery of um, the introduction to Chinese export porcelain into this larger space. So we have 130 pieces of, of Chinese porcelain on the wall uh, with, a, with an accompanying guide. So there are no labels on the wall mm. to, to, not, um, to not interfere with the, with the, the visual splendor. Yeah, it looks fantastic. I, I haven't, I still haven't made it to the Peabody Essex myself. So this is a, it's a very good incentive to, to visit the museum. And this is just, maybe you want to talk quickly about this. This, I guess this is your intro. 
And I like so the way I just, you flip the map yeah. as well. Yeah. Yes. I've mentioned that these these various entrances and the fact that we begin each entrance with a question here um, is the question, how far would you go to get what you want? And we've we've um, highlighted that question in three of the languages that are central to mm -hmm. the artists who've created the works in Bengali, in Chinese and Japanese. Uh, but we also wanted to both orient and then disorient our visitors. So you can see there is a world map but it is both upside down and inside out. So it's it's a little bit hard to look at. It's, it's familiar and also unfamiliar. And then we've called out, I think seven or eight places around the globe that are central to the story we're telling in the gallery. I'm, I'm pleased that Salem is the only um, city in North America called out. Lima in South America, mm -hmm. Manila is here, um, Calcutta, um, Nagasaki, uh, Guangzhou, I think. That, yeah, that and I think be. by centering it on the, on the Pacific London Ocean, and yeah, it's true. Yeah. By centering it on the Pacific Ocean as well, I think it makes really clear what I think the previous discussion, you know, about the importance of of Manila and so forth in, in terms of this trade, you know. All right. Jan, this is tell us a bit about this. There's a lot, there's a lot going on in this photograph. Um, yes. What well, is this a photograph of a special exhibition? An exhibition. Um, Karina and and I and together with lots of other people curated in 2015 Asia and Amsterdam. It was about luxuries, luxury goods for Amsterdam in the 17th century, and we focused very specifically on the the aspect of luxury and the aesthetic quality of the objects and the impact um, it had on Dutch Dutch society. And um, you can see here that there was a lot of design in this exhibition and Kiki van Eyck was the designer and she took little elements of the objects displayed in a room and then she made a, a tiny watercolor and it was blown up to use as a wall covering. And uh, uh, I was a bit surprised seeing this picture myself because here you, you have the idea that this is in some exhibition about how to contemporary wall covering with a few objects right around <laughs> but that was not the impression when you entered the room you, re you really saw the object and the wall covering helped to well to 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 try to imagine the impact the arrival of those exotic objects had in the 17th century at the time all right there's a few questions coming up i think clem i'll let you talk about acm first and then i'll, then I'll track back and, and we, we can just quickly address some of the questions and then we'll wrap it up uh, so here's the trade gallery. Clem, you want to talk a little bit about this? I was just looking at the questions. <laughs> this is, uh, this is actually, this is considered quite an old shot already compared mm. to Venus, uh, a photo of the uh, Asian Export Art Gallery. This, this, I think this shot was taken in 2016 where we first opened the, the Maritime Trade Gallery. So there are a few changes uh, and upgrades uh, uh, to this, but 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 really, I mean, it's it's to look at a lot of all this um, uh, export art or Asian export art in in a very thematic uh, approach. Um, sometimes by classified by material type, sometimes by by linking. I mean, what you can see from the far left corner, you know, is this, is a showcase of uh, different types of blue and white export porcelain, also known as the crop wares from China, from from Delft. From, from Arita, again, just to, to put it up to you in one showcase to show you the, the sort of artistic exchanges and, and how, you know, uh, as we all say, sort of imitation is also a form of flattering and how uh, various markets has been, you know, being so competitive uh, back in those days. And then, and then, and then as, as it goes, you know, it's also uh, in, in some way, chronologically, we end with sort of, uh, 18 all the way to 20th century trade, China trade, and, and some of its you know, China trade influence into Southeast Asia uh, as well. All right, and yeah, this is just this quick room. And this is another. There is a side room, yeah, which we really, uh, we, I mean, uh, it, it's, I mean, there is the Tang Shipwreck. In Tang Shipwreck uh, Gallery, we ended off with some of the earliest, um, uh, there is an Abbasid blue and white you know, earthenware, and then there is the three stonewares of early examples of Chinese blue and white, experimental blue and white. And we thought to continue that conversation in this little room here, which talks about the, uh, the sort of, you know, exchanges between China and the Middle East, 
uh, through blue and white ceramics, well, porcelain from China, uh, mainly Qingdezhen and, 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 and Zhangzhou uh, types of blue and white porcelain. And then again, uh, juxtaposed with Indian Deccan uh, metalware, uh, that certain forms were inspiring the Chinese porcelain and, and also Isnik and um, uh, Safavid uh, uh, frit uh, ware ceramics as well. Great. Yeah, it really shows the range, I guess, in this, this gallery. Okay, I think just to really wrap it up, um, there's a few questions. Let's just try and deal with a few of them. And one from Sue, uh, she, for all of you. Um, in the case of the pieces from the late 18th, early 19th Canton trade, and originally brought to the West by Europeans, um, do your collections contain pieces originally purchased by private traders, or were they from traders in various East India? East India companies. Uh, you want to take that? I think all of the above. We certainly have mm. things that are associated with many of the um, East India companies in Europe that were special commissions by them, but um, certainly there are, and also bulk cargo, but then things that are, you know, that are very. Uh, Special, that are special orders from private traders. Well, likewise for the ACM. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, well, often we don't know, of course, and it is really uh, special to be well informed about um, about provenance information and first owners. That's very important to make it makes it a, a very a valuable museum object if you have this information. Absolutely. Quick one for Clem. Um, where the cabinets, I, I guess it's uh, talking about the Filipino cabinet, were they made for easy carry since the users were probably traders and mission, missionaries that frequently travel both on land and sea? I, I think so. I think it's, it's in that tradition, you know, where many of these uh, uh, cabinets uh, or sort of the forefront uh, desks were, were made uh, for, for that portability uh, sake. And, and it, it just makes, I mean, you would imagine that during a presentation to, to, to someone important, it just makes it easier than, than getting, you know, people to move a whole trunk. In. Right, yeah. Karina, I, I, I like this question. Um, is the large vase not in the showcase? Yeah, it's quite amazing that you have that yes. on open display. How did you, how did so you? I think Doris asked that question and she was with us at the Peabody Essex when we were planning this gallery. And indeed it is, um, it is on a table that is as strong as a tank. So <laughs> the table's not moving anywhere. And then it is, it has very elaborate mounts that okay. are um, quite obscured. So you can't really, they're, they're not impacting your, your visual, but they are, um, it, it's very securely on that, that on uh, tank here. of the table. Mm. And then <laughs> I think there's about 150 pounds of weight inside the vase ah. so i don't I, I think it's true if somebody comes with a giant hammer we're in trouble but other than that i think there is really <laughs> nothing that and that's sort of one of the things you know it, where we began our conversations with blue and white porcelain um this when when blue and white porcelain comes up from a shipwreck other than the fact that the glazing is is um cloudy the blue design is as brilliant as it was the day it was made because it's under the glaze. So, so although we don't want anybody touching this, no amount of touching is going to, is going to do anything um, mm. to this. And we really just, because it's so much more immediate to not have it behind glass. Yeah. I mean, it's um, fantastic when it's like that. It really, I think, like you say, particularly with porcelain, it, I think for the average visitor that maybe is, you know, maybe not, a connoisseur or someone who's you know maybe familiar with porcelain this i you know i think you you just you can't walk past it and not and not stop right it's um steven would you mind going back to the the sure. slide with the questions i just because yeah. i think this other question is about touch screens and you can see mm. there is the, the monitor below it is on and this is actually showing um a three minute cartoon we've created uh, about Augustus the Strong and his obsession with porcelain. I think my, I have a six-year-old and my goal was to get her interested in 
uh, Chinese export porcelain. And certainly if you can get a six-year-old interested, you, you can hopefully also get people who don't yeah. particularly care about porcelain interested. <laughs> um, this, we are still, um, we are still allowing people to touch this, this with, with reopening. I will say the guide, and I don't know, where is it? Um, we have a, a quite a beautiful guide to the porcelain wall. And um, that of course is not something that we could have people um, looking at in COVID. We are open to the public at the moment. Um, so there are uh, handouts that are doing the, the tombstone identifications for everything in the wall. But one of my goals is to get that entire guide on our website. And we certainly mm -hmm. um, have been doing as everyone has so much more work on the digital, the digital yeah. world. We, we've our, switched our, to, to, yeah. to QR codes for some of our newer galleries because we, again, we, we had like touchscreen uh, applications for the third floor galleries. So I guess that's one way of doing it, but yeah, I mean, it's a challenge, right? Particularly with, with, with handouts and stuff. And there's a quick question about why is the map upside down? I think you, you pretty much answered it, but I, I don't know if you want to, if you want to say any, she's asked it again. Yeah, I wondered whether that question had come in after. So, so the sort of from an idea of, um, of attention mapping, there is, there is the thought that um, if you are disoriented and then are reoriented, you are you are looking more carefully and your mind is more open to be able to be taking in information and so that as a sort of abstract concept is something that we talk about a lot at the Peabody Essex. Clearly this is a map that disorients but I think we also wanted to reorient our visitors on Asia because I think so often when we're talking about Asian export art we're talking about the markets to which these materials went rather than the, the, the um, communities of artists who created these extraordinary works of art. And we really wanted to center the dialogue on Asia. And um, this is also the first time, at least at the Peabody Essex, that we're really in a permanent gallery displaying works from many different um, uh, centers of production in dialogue with each other. So, um, so it, it is confusing, but it's sort of intended to be confusing. Mm. But I guess there's, there's, there's precedent. I mean, for, uh, what do you call them? Fra Maro's map from 1450 or so is upside down or, or yeah. so it's not, you know, I think it's a clever way of, uh, maybe there's this assumption that, you know, maps are just, you know, a schematic way of showing the world and you can do it from many perceptions. It's just, I think it's, it is a very interesting idea. Okay, I think probably and that we will, yes, uh, we'll bring this discussion to a close for everyone there. If you can fill out the feedback form, that would be great. Um, yeah, and it just all that leaves me to say is just a big thank you to Karina, uh, Jan, and of course Clem um for having this discussion and for everybody in the audience for all the really interesting and, and wonderful questions i think it's it's been great so thank you all thank you thank you for having us no, okay. thank, thank you very much moderating and thanks uh denise and ratna you know behind the scenes yeah. everyone absolutely thank you thanks Jan. thanks okay thanks it was a pleasure. we hope Bye. to be in singapore at some point soon yes yeah. we hope we, we can <laughs> We will, uh, I hope to go visit you in Salem for sure. And, yes, yes. Uh, Please do come. Amsterdam's an easier, will be an easier trip for me, but yeah, Salem will be. Yeah, great. yes, it will. It will. Absolutely. All right. Bye. Thank Thanks, you very everyone. much. Bye bye. bye.